Hello there, Ruth Spire TV. My name's Aaron Dugan, and I'm coming to you from South Fork, Colorado um, today. Kind of in between places during the pandemic. But I'm going to start off by just playing some things here. And if uh, it'd be lovely to, to go back and forth with you on the comments and just maybe hang out and answer some questions. All right, let's start doing something here. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Well, what up, Aaron? Okay, what's going on? Thank you. Um, all right. Just gonna keep jamming here for you. If y'all have any questions, um, I might start out by playing um, this tune I wrote. And it was um, actually an artist named Just Goody just recorded. We turned it into a song called Just Fine. And um, it's based on this bass line. Um, it's a reggae tune. And I'll turn my little uh, octave pedal on here. And um, here's how it goes. <laughs> just the E minor chord so if, if, if the beat goes one two three four that's the only chord I've been playing actually maybe I'll do it through a loop so you can hear it um, see if So I started out with maybe, I think I remember how to, I wrote it like five years ago, but I had something like this. Um, I added a couple notes. Kind of like a stepper's groove. And so, um, so to complete that phrase, um, um, I kind of wanted to make sure that none of the notes were repeated, like like the phrase didn't repeat on itself right away. So I, I wanted to make it interesting. And also I wanted the rhythm to not, like the rhythm of the notes, the syncopation to to kind of like not be too uh, what do you call it predictable. So it would have been easy to do something like you know. Took me a little while to come up with it, but and so if it were 
the key of E here and this is it. And then it's, the, the, the last note of the bass line is C, which kind of adds tension because, and also um, it adds a little tension. So then I can start the second part of the riff, which is different from the first part of the riff. Um, so the second part is. Thank <laughs> you. 
So, um, the question here is from Rootfire, and it's, uh, thanks Rootfire, um, and the question is, do you have any practice routines you live by, any rituals for getting in the zone for show? Oh, I'll do the first question. Any practice routines I live by, or, I mean, I guess they change. A lot of times when I practice, I practice jazz standards because um, each tune is is not in one specific key. It's in the keys are changing, the chords are changing, there's counterpoint involved. Um, and it's just for me to get my my lines together, my you know my my lines. lines that become second nature to me or like the um or just trying to 
hear how different keys kind of go into each other or different chords blend in with each other. Lately, I've been practicing this tune called Reflections by Polonius Monk, and it, the chords, you know, go A flat major seven, G flat seven, F seven, E seven, two five. Um, so basically, like the each. Uh, let me see how I can do this. Uh, explain this. If the beat's like. One, two, three, four. The chord moves changes so I'll go ahead and I'll play um, I'll like stick to this area here maybe like a, the what would this be like the eighth eighth right here and I'll try to play through it kind of interesting and so um it really keeps my it's kind of almost like crossword puzzles i don't play a lot of jazz professionally these days but um it really keeps me going and learning because when i if i approach like a when i first approach a tune sometimes it's, it's very i've never seen those chords back to back together so for me to even understand how to hit them in time it can be kind of daunting so um that's one thing i've been doing a lot lately um the other thing i've been practicing recently is um besides writing 
I've been, sometimes I'll just, I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, weird, but just like a simple funk rhythm. sense that like my right hand I'm left-handed so my right hand will slip up a lot or like I'll just kind of fudge something um so I've been lately trying to just see if I can like and it's a feel thing too because some well, I said you know play like maybe a, a funk rhythm I would um really dig in too hard you know I, I don't know just try. so now I just try to like you know a little bit and that it just wasn't super steady you know which is a good thing it's a good thing to like really nit nitpick all the little flaws while you're practicing that's what practicing is for is to kind of like really get in there and um kind of criticize your playing you know uh and then coach it and then also being okay with it, um, ultimately. There's like a, you know, I can, I can, there's about five, you know, I felt like when I was hitting the one, it was a little too heavy. It could have been like a little more chilled out because, you know, that was sort of like a James Brownish kind of like on the one um, rhythm. And so the whole point is the feel and it's like the, it's like kind of like a rolling thing. And if you hear a good funk band or like a great funk band, there's like some kind of, you know, they're just, they're in their own group. Each band has their own group, but it's an ease. Like, okay, let's have, let's, let's have an easy time. Um, let's not make this funk sound angry, you know, stuff like that. Those are a couple of things I do when I practice. Um, rituals for getting any rituals for getting in the zone for shows. Um, well, they change because I've been on the road for a while, maybe since two thousand one, and um, the ritual used to be like, okay, let's have like a, let's let me have a shot, so. I feel kind of loose and I, that was, you know, that, 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 that's happened. But, um, I would say, um, I'm, I got into meditation, um, by this guy, uh, through this guy, Jack Cornfield. And, um, I just go by myself, um, into like a, you know, quiet area and I try to, you know, meditate for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. That's, um, one of the, that's probably the best thing. And and the other thing is the, um, just uh, forward fold, like a yoga kind of forward fold, staying there for a while 
any kind of inversion to kind of let the blood go to the head. I don't run around and jump around and stuff. Um, I really, I play with people who do do that and I really get a kick out of it. And I think it's a great thing to do. Um, you know, especially bass players and drummers like to kind of like get really heated before a show. And um, I think it's great. Um, nothing really more than that though. Those are probably the only, definitely like, I like silence though. I like a lot of silence before a show and after the show too. What we have here. Hey, Tom. All right, so I have a question here. Um, what effects are on your rig right now? Any tips for building out your tones? Um, well, this is my travel. I usually have like a larger kind of, you know with a bunch of different pedals that I bring, uh, but we're in between houses right now because of the pandemic. And this is the only thing I could really fit in the car. So I have this, um, you know, this mini board here with a volume pedal, uh, reverb, delay, and a pitch shifter. Um, and then I have this Line 6 Helix, which is really cool because it's got a bunch of things built in um, and it's all one unit. So you don't have to worry about shortages and, and stuff like that. And it's got a tuner and it's got a looper. And um, so basically I have this as an effects out going from the, from the Helix. Um, I would say for building your tone, I mean, everyone's got their own tone, so it's like building your voice or anything else, but uh, it's taken me, I, it's taken me so, like, every day and years, just to, it's a constant, uh, it's constantly in flux, and, um, but one thing I have, a few things I have learned that is that, uh, you know, for if I'm playing reggae music, um, a good a good reverb sound is, is, is essential, like a I kind of like that. I like this pedal. It's pretty cool. Um, then you can you can really go, you know, more. Um, what do you call it? An extreme with it. I really get a kick out of that. Um, so, uh, was it electro harmonics makes this pedal called the holy grail and i've had about eight of them break on the road so i don't have one right now but a, one thing i used to love to do like to dub is, is punch my pickup um on that pedal it, no other pedal has really given me that sort of the same uh satisfaction but you see like that one it, 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 it the holy grail there's like a real like but um let's see can i get this yeah so okay so the tone's a little trebly on that so i bring the tone i'm on the spring uh setting of this oceans 11 so i'm bringing the tone back down to, to be a little less trebly and you bring the time up i want more i want more so that's something I like to do, uh, the reverb pedal. And it's, this pedal has an interesting uh, feature where if you click it twice, it does a spring, like you're hitting a spring cell. So it's kind of nice, especially if you have another reverb on. Is there another reverb on this? Well, I don't think I have one on here. So let's pretend there's a softer reverb on. So delay, 
I really, I really like the sound of analog delays. Right now, I have a Vapor Trail um, Seymour Duncan pedal, and um, I basically like doing stuff like this. <laughs> stuff like this. So the interesting thing about um, delay pedals is that each one, you know, there'll be like a mix, uh, you know, a mix uh, knob, and then there'll be a repeats knob, and there'll be a delay time knob, and each pedal is different. Like, like for one pedal, you'll have to turn it one way, and for another, you'll have to turn it another way. So it takes me a while to get to to know each each pedal I have. Um, this pitchfork here, this uh, electric harmonics pitchfork, it's pretty cool because um, I found out, I found that when I'm playing like, say I'm like improvising with Modest Yahoo or something, he's beatboxing, I can kind of have the pedal, I can take away the direct signal of the guitar on this pedal and have only an octave up and an octave down playing at the same time. So instead of this note, you get this note. And um, this, you can do the same thing on other pedals, but this is the only pedal I've found that has a real crisp kind of nasty nasty tone to it so like if i'm i don't know <laughs> set up right now but um yeah, i like doing stuff Thank you. 
And then it's always nice to have a, a good phaser. Um, the Helix has a decent phaser. Let's see some. Phaser, um, and the wah. This is a cool. There's a cool wah on this. Um, let's see. <laughs> Something I used to like to do, and I still do like to do, um, but I don't do it as much as I like to play the, the bubble on the guitar. So um, this is like a newer wah for me, so I'm not sure if I can do it. But um, I like to, I re I always love the bubble, like the if you know you got a chuck going. That's usually the guitar part, but then the, the keyboard is always going. I remember the first one of the first times I heard reggae on Princeton Radio growing up in Philly. Um, they had a they had a reggae show on Sunday and I was like, what the fuck is that? I mean I was just say say for kids if I'm allowed to say that, but um I always I, I wanted to know what that sound was, um, and and I was surprised that a guitar never did it. So I vowed that I would. That was the part I wanted to play. Obviously, it doesn't sound as like authentic, or it doesn't sound like a keyboard. But I just like doing that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, how did you link up with Modest Yahoo? Is the question. Um, well, we both went to the New School in Manhattan. Um, I went for jazz. Uh, I was a jazz major, and he was a theater major um, at the liberal arts school. And so he was in a play with a, a few friends of mine, and um, he started coming out to shows that I would play or shows that my friends would play. And we all just were in a kind of similar circle. And he... Um, he would just sit in with the bands and um he always had this really cool reggae thing he did and um you know of course i didn't i didn't really know much about the reggae genre like intensely at that time but i could tell you know he had something there and then um we briefly played in that band uh with jason fraticelli and taylor mcferrin together briefly and then um 
that was before he was religious, I think. And then I saw him on the street on Bedford Avenue in Williamsburg. And he said, uh, this is two years after we graduated. We hadn't seen each other in a while. And he saw me and he said, Dugan. And I looked up and uh, there were these uh, Hasidic kids with the shofar and like going around, you know, I think it's Rosh Hashanah. And I was like, huh? So I didn't recognize him and he, and it was him. I was like, Matt? And he said, oh yeah, yeah. And so he said he had a gig, a Hanukkah lighting menorah gig um, at Union Square. And if I would play it with him, so I, we just improvised all the time. And, it was fun, and then there were more gigs to be had, so we just kept playing together. And then we got a, you know, we got a really nice reggae band together, Roots Tonic, with jo Josh Warner and Jonah David, and um, just kind of took off from there. I think the tightness that band kind of had, the four of us together, kind of made it really something special. Um, what are what are some of your most memorable moments for live from live shows? Okay. <laughs> oh my God, there's so many. It was it was really nice to play at Madison Square Garden um, because you know it's just. I was a big Flyers fan, and they played the Rangers a lot. And you you heard about Madison Square Garden your whole life, so um, we were opening up for OAR actually. And when we were coming up the stairs um, to the stage, there was like a roar in the stadium that was so intense, and I'd never heard anything like that before. And I just remember, like, yeah, let's do it. I was, the, you know, not like a nervous thing, but it was just like adrenaline. Or like, like, I didn't let myself think I was nervous. I was probably was nervous, but I didn't admit it or something. And then, um, but you, I transitioned that, that energy into just, that was a really great moment. Um, playing at Coachella was really nice. That was like a, just a, a sea of, it's, 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 it's really nice when you have like a lot of attention and uh, accept it. You're not playing to like a, I like playing to tough crowds too, but like, you know, there's something about like an incredible amount of people and they're all, it's all just one thing, you know, like you're, and you're part of it. Um, and I was used to being the, the audience member part of it, but it's nice being the, one of the people making music for a lot of people. Um, I remember that being very special. And then, um, we opened up for Dave Matthews Band twice in 06. And I remember that, the set, not for us, but when I would be a side stage and then Dave would go on and I would almost lost my hearing. And um, after the second show, Dave, after, the, after Dave Matthews Encore, he came up to me and I was standing by the monitor guy, so right you know, last night he came up to me and he said it was a really great playing with you. And and so I thought that was really, it's a really nice thing to do from someone, you know, someone that's accomplished the same. That was really, that was a really fond memory. Okay, so this is a cool, this is a nice, um, this is a nice question. How, by Caro Yer, um, how are you doing during these crazy times? You're usually usually touring a lot. How are you finding ways to cope? Well, that's a work in progress. Um, things like this are really special, and and it, it little things that come up like this, where you make your living room into like a little like um, studio, and you get to like perform for people online. That's a really nice thing that that's come. I mean, hopefully we're back to normal soon. Um, it's I really miss playing with other musicians, and we I do do things where we'll send each other music, and there'll be some 
something will come out of it, but it's just not the same. Um, it's really challenging. And I thought it was going to be over by now. And because it's not over, because I'm realizing I'm having to double down on this isolation, it's a real challenge. So, um, but that's the choice I have right now. So, um, hopefully teaching, I'm, I'm available for online lessons. I like to teach online. Um, I try to call my friends, we do Zoom, uh, Zoom sessions and, you know, just me and my girlfriend Marie just hanging out, a couple dogs. That's nice. Um, we're bouncing from place to place. We were in Taos, New Mexico, then Santa Fe, and now we're in Colorado. We might go back to Taos. I thought I was going to be going closer to New York because that's where, where I'll probably end up again. But it looks like there's no point. So we're just going to do month to month things here and there and, and take it as it comes. And, you know, just I'm sure something, some great things will happen. Um, and I hope everyone else is doing well out there too. It's, it's, it must be really challenging for everybody. Okay. So here, here's a good question. Um, who are some guitar players you've learned a lot listening to their playing? I mean, it's endless. It's really musicians for me. Like Coltrane's not, not a guitar player, but, uh, I was very much influenced by John Coltrane. Um, just his attitude towards music and his humble, uh, the, how humble he, he was and how intense he was when he played. And um, so he's probably like, probably him and Ornette Coleman, another sax player, um, Jerry Garcia. I've never heard anyone do anything like he does. It's just there's something that you cannot put your like you can't can't first of all you could people could do it now but no one had done it before then and I think it's an it's a testament to his humbleness and how much he was a servant to the music. Um, I love Jerry Garcia's playing and his writing. I love people. I think the guitar players I love most are really good writers as well. Um, obviously Hendrix is, you know, I kind of, I'm kind of an admirer of Jimi Hendrix. I'm just, yep. Cause there's like a hundred thousand, you know, people now doing what he does. And it's, 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 but when, again, no one had done that the way even close to the way he did it when he started. So, um, and I think the people who are doing his thing now are cool too. It's, it's just, it's listening to the sort, the fact that you're, the fact that recordings exist at all and that you can listen to the, to the source is really a special thing. Um, I love Jamie. Um, oh man, there's so many guitar players. Uh, Obviously, well, I like I like Fred Frith. Fred Frith is like an experimental guitar. I've never heard when he does. But he does a big influence. Uh, Nell Klein is another influence. Um, uh, who else? Oh gosh, so many, so many guitars. Um, I. I'm trying to think of a different style. I mean, like Peter Bernstein, I like uh, Mark Rabot, um, people I've played with. Um, my friend Maya Dunitz is a piano player, but she's incredible. Amy Carrigan, vocalist, uh, Jeff Arnell, Mark Giuliani, Juli Juliana, um, you know, Jason Fraticelli. There's so many people. Um, yeah, it's just so many. Oh, there's a request to play some dead. Okay, I'll try. 
I'll try to play some Grateful Dead. I'll, I'll just maybe in the style of, but you know, make no mistake, there's only one uh, Jerry Garcia. Um, <laughs> themselves today um and thanks so much for letting me do this big thanks to all the people at root fire big thanks to kevin at backstage lessons until next time take care